So I'm going to kind of jump ahead. Uh, this is now week 11 uh, in a series that I started called um, The Sermon on the Mount, The Believer's Manifesto. Um, for lack of time and consideration, I'm not going to go back. We've covered basically through verse 12 of that passage, which encompasses the eight Beatitudes. I'm not going back over the Beatitudes. If you want to see those, you can read them for yourself in the Word of God, which I encourage you to do. You can go back and watch the lessons that are on the YouTube live stream. But we've covered all the way through the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are basically where Christ bestowed on us these amazing attributes, or what he calls states of blessedness, that show us what we will look like, how we will act if we are truly his, and if he is truly active and alive inside of us. So today we're going to move forward into Matthew's Gospel. I'm actually going to jump a little ahead. Instead of going to verse 13, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, and then I'll come back to it at the end. So I'm actually going to go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. If you've got your Bibles, you can flip open there real quick. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. I'm going to be reading out of the NASB. And Jesus said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill... For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven." Um, real quickly, uh, my brain just jumped track. I mean, I meant to say something to you guys, to reiterate something I said last week, that today is the first Sunday that we have called the Family Day. I told you we're going to start this once a month. We're going to have everybody in the sanctuary. I explained to you guys why, just to reiterate, because I just realized I didn't mention it again, from Julie coming up and talking. It is very important that from the time that they're infants and to toddlers and children to the youth that they see and hear how the parents, the adults, the spiritually mature in this church come together, worship together, study the Word of God together, pray together. They need to be trained up in that. And for that very reason, years ago, back in like 2008, we built this room off to the back side of the sanctuary called a cry room. It's an amenity that we have for young mothers that have infants. If the child, and they will get that way at times, if the child is getting cranky, crying, needs to be changed, you have a room back there that has a one-way glass so that you can see through it. We can't see you. You can nurse. You can rock them. You can, we've got things set up for nursing mothers. It's not for the fathers. If the father has a child, you can go out in the foyer. We've got tables in the, the men's room. But this room is for mothers who have infants. It's for that reason. If you have a husband that's getting cranky and needs to be changed, take him out in the parking lot or something. <laughs> but we have amenities for you because we want our families in here once a month. Praise God. I'm moving forward. Um. <laughs> when Jesus gave us those states of blessedness that I refer to, the, the eight beatitudes that he said that we would walk in, these were radical statements when he made those things. When he said you are blessed for doing these things, they were radical then and they are radical now. Nowhere in the world's standards will you ever hear somebody being called blessed who is poor, who is meek, who is hungry, who is suffering and, and, and being persecuted. That's not the way the world does things. And Jesus made radical statements when he said this. He was showing us that as we serve him, as we follow him uh, with our lives, we should be progressively growing in, the, in those areas, which I stress to you guys. And in doing so, we receive the blessings of heaven in our lives now and for the life to come. And when your heart is so in line with God's will that you count it a blessing to suffer and be persecuted for his name's sake, you can be sure that your reward in heaven will be great. Amen? But then from there, after he tells us these states of blessedness, if you jump down to verse 17, Jesus gives us his mission statement, why he was coming to this earth. He said, I didn't, I didn't come down here on the earth to put an end to or to make invalid the, uh, the commandments and the laws and the prophets. I didn't come to make them annulled or to do away with them. He said, I came to fulfill them. That's the purpose of why I'm coming. Every ounce of everything written that's recorded in the law and the prophets, I am coming to fulfill because I am the living word of God. I am the fulfillment of those things. He said, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until everything is accomplished. The iota, and, and this is to show the detail of what he was putting into this statement, 
is the smallest of the Greek letters. Um, it corresponds with what we call the Yod, which is the smallest of the Hebrew letters. So he's saying to the smallest letter that we have in our language, and then he says to the dot. That in the Greek refers to the stroke of a pen. Uh, it's like the smallest stroke that you can make. Uh, I think in the King James Bible, it's referred to as the tittle. In English, we would understand this. If I was to write the capital letter E and the capital letter F, that one little stroke at the bottom of the E is what differentiates the E from the F. That is the tittle. That is that dot that he was talking about, that jot that he was talking about. That's what he's referring to. So he says, from the smallest of the letters, the most insignificant of the letters, to the smallest, most minute stroke of the pen that you can make, it's relevant, it's important, it's my Father's word, and I'm coming to fulfill every aspect of everything that he's ever given to you. I'm the fulfillment. That's what he was saying. And so Yeshua said that anyone that annuls or relaxes even the smallest, the, the least of the commandments would be considered or called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to pay attention here to what Yeshua is saying to the exact verbiage that he says. Anyone that relaxes, that means if you set it aside, if you give it of least significance, make it seemingly irrelevant, if you do this and you teach other people to do the same thing, I'm saying to you that you are least in my Father's kingdom. What he didn't say is if anyone disobeys or breaks the least of the commands, they are called least. Understand what he's saying here. He's saying, because we all are going to transgress, we all do things wrong. He's saying that if you limit any one of my Father's laws and commands and what has been written out, and you call it least or lesser or anything else, he says, it's not yours to mandate or to rule over. It's my Father's commands. You do not have the right to interpret and lessen this one and elevate this one. It's all relative and it's all important. And if you do that, if you lessen any one of these commands and then teach somebody else to do the same, I'm saying you are least in his kingdom. So no one could make light of any part of the law or the prophets or anything that they taught and, or, or ignore them. That's not relevant anymore. How many times have you heard people say about the word of God? That's not relevant anymore. It, it, it runs all over me like a freight train when I hear somebody say, well, that was old school. God and the Bible have progressed into a new generation. It's evolved. No, your brains evolve backwards because God's word changes not. That's what it says. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, all, everybody say, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, not lacking in any area. All of the Word was breathed out by God, and it is all pertinent and relevant, even today. And the legal zealots of Yeshua's day and time, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the elite that everybody looked up to, had gotten to the point by the time that Yeshua was walking this earth, that they prided themselves and boasted before other people about how they kept all the law. About, you know, that we do this. Look at what we do. We hold ourselves esteemed above the rest of you because we keep the law to its fullest measure. And yet, according to the Christ, they weren't getting into the kingdom. Now, how is that possible? How is it possible that someone that is so meticulous at keeping God's laws and commands that they couldn't make it into the kingdom of God. Because Jesus says at the end of that passage that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not make it in, which means they're not getting in. Yeshua said that, and this is what he meant. The Pharisees and the legal zealots of that day and time were all about outward works. They took the laws and the commands of God and they made it into a system to where they could do things that were outwardly showing everybody how great they were. But inside, they were full of jealousy, anger, wrath, bitterness, unforgiveness. So he was saying that their righteousness was based on outward appearance and not on the desire to do the will of God. And because they didn't love God's commands, all of them. If you read Matthew chapter 23, I'm going to read this real quickly to you. This is what we call the woes that Jesus pronounced upon the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat to swallow a camel. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And you have to understand, when Jesus was calling the religious elites of that day hypocrites, that was easily punishable. I mean, you could be locked up, incarcerated, or put away, and never seen again for what he was saying to these people. You hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like a whitewashed tomb, which outwardly appears beautiful, but inside is full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous before others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Yeshua was saying to the legal zealots of his day and time, that they were so meticulous that he said, you, you tithe even to the least of the, the herbs and spices that you're growing in your garden. You're so meticulous about that stuff so that other people see what you're doing when you bring it in and pronounce, I'm tithing this today. He says, but you've missed completely. You've lessened and negated the weighty matters of my father's law. You have walked away from uh, justice uh, from mercy, from faithfulness, the things that God requires of us, you have set these aside and made it all about outward appearance, outward manifestation. So he pronounced the woes upon him. And he says, because of your outward manifestation, you are not truly righteous. You have neglected my, God, my father's words. Therefore, you are not entering into his kingdom. So when you look at this, you're like, how is it the religious elites aren't getting in? How am I going to get in? Because God didn't call you to be religious. He called you to be a follower of his son and let his son radically change you. They were righteous in their own eyes, but not according to the will and not according to the commands of God. The command of God. The law of God, and, and I love that Debbie, uh, Debbie, Lord have mercy, I'm looking at Debbie. Julie said that this morning. The law of God, the word of God, is perfect in its entirety. And no man at that time or this time either, if it was still in existence, would be able to live up to the full measure of that law. The law of God served as a tutor, if you will. It was always there to show and remind mankind that they were sinful and that they were in need of a Savior. That they were in need of someone that could come and shed perfect blood to cover and make atonement for their sins. And the law of God from start to finish, as Jesus says, from the smallest letter to the smallest stroke, had to be taken in its entirety. Not fragmented, not separated, not broken up to appease the hearts of wicked people. The law of God was like a large glass window, if you will. A huge, solid sheet of glass. I'm not talking about this tempered stuff that you can shoot with a bullet and it doesn't break it. I'm talking about just a regular pane of glass. That's what the law of God was like. And even if you went to the bottom corner of that pane of glass and you chipped and broke one little piece of it, the whole pane shatters. If you broke one part of the law, you were guilty of all of the law. That's why no person was ever righteous or pure enough to be able to pay the price that had to be paid. James says the same thing in his epistle. He says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of the law. The law and its commands was the will of God, and until the law could be fulfilled, until it could be satiated by a man, it was binding on all men. And no man was ever able to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law because everyone that has ever been born since Adam and Eve was born into a disease that we call sin. From the moment that you were conceived in the womb because of the blood of your parents, you are born into sin. It doesn't matter if you're a day old, a 50 days old, or a 100 years old, you are born into sin. And if you pay attention to the law of Moses, if you go back and you read it, study the book of Leviticus. Look at all of the details that God put into place as far as the observances, um, the feasts, uh, the, the requirements of the law. It was all about purity and cleanliness. And you start to notice something that God was saying to the people in all these different ways of their life, how unclean they really were. If, if, if uh, somebody cut themselves and they're bleeding... They become unclean. If a woman's menstruating, she becomes unclean. If you touch the woman while she's menstruating, you become unclean. Anything that she sat on or after she's given birth for up to 60 days, if you touch her or touch what she's been handling, you're unclean. If you touch somebody that has any kind of discharge from the body, they're unclean, now you're unclean. If you touch what they sat on or what they handled, you're unclean. If you touch a dead body, a set of dead bones, if you touch a grave, you're unclean. It was all about uncleanliness. And the only way that you could become ritually clean was through atonement. Something had to make atonement. If you go back and you read, uh, I think it's in Numbers 19, you study about the red heifer of Israel. 
And God said that you were to bring to me a red heifer. She's to be taken outside of the gates of the city, a pure, spotless, never yoked, meaning a young one. You take her up there, the priest is to sacrifice her. He's to bring the blood back in, sprinkle it seven times upon the tabernacle, then go back out. The heifer in its entirety is to be a burnt offering. The priest that killed her has to be purified because he's unclean. The one that burns the heifer is now unclean. He has to be purified. The one that gathers the ashes is unclean. He has to be purified. Then you're going to take the the ashes from this heifer and you're going to make a solution of water to sprinkle on people that are unclean. It was all about uncleanliness, needing cleanliness, and needing purification. And it all pointed to one source. Only one was ever going to be able to make all clean for all times. And that was the Christ. God was showing us from the start, you're unclean. You're never going to be good enough. You can't do enough works. And even today, it's the same. No matter how much you think that you do, no matter how much you think you do for the church or in your community, you're never going to be good enough to be clean because of your works. That's why God said through the prophet Isaiah, we have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like polluted or filthy garments. We fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have been taken away. Everything that we do on our own in order to become righteous before God is counted as a filthy garment. And that word filthy in the actual Hebrew rendering refers to like a cloth or a rag that was used to um, soak up where a woman was on her menstrual cycle. It's talking about just a polluted garment. It's filthy. And that's what he says, your works are no better than that. You cannot earn the righteousness or become clean in God because of how good you think you are and because of what all you are doing in the name of God. Every detail of the law, Jesus said, down to the minuscule pieces of it, are pointing to me, and I'm coming to fulfill it, guys. That's what I'm here for. That's my sole purpose. And let me emphasize to you right now that even today, some 2,000 years after Yeshua went to the cross, after he rose from the grave... That's what we celebrated last weekend was Resurrection Sunday. After he completed all the righteous requirements of the law, we must regard the Old Testament as of equal importance to that of the New Testament today. I'm going to say it again. I love, and I didn't talk to Julie beforehand. She said that because that's what the Holy Spirit had on her heart. We don't have the right to to lessen or to de-emphasize one part of God's Word and call another part of it more important and more worthy of teaching. This is what Yeshua was saying about the law and the people in the Sermon on the Mount. You don't get to say which part is greater or lesser because that's my Father's words. And people today tend to spend more of their time devoted towards studying the New Testament. More preachers spend more of their time devoted towards teaching the New Testament. And I understand the New Testament contains the gospel message. It is the message of good news. It is the message of salvation. I get that. I really do. I love the New Testament. But you don't have a New Testament without the Old Testament. There is no New Covenant if God had never established the Old Covenant. So when I hear preachers say, well, we don't talk about prophecy because it's just, it's not relevant today and it confuses people. Do you know that prophecy is one-fourth of this book? How are you going to negate one-fourth of the Bible and call it no longer relevant or hard to teach on? For the same reason that people say we don't like to discuss blood, sacrifice. It's just messy and it really confuses and it it doesn't set well with people. So, that's exactly right. You better pray that your heart comes to a reckoning with the blood of Jesus the Christ that was shed shed for your sins because one day you're going to stand before a righteous king. And you're going to be asked to give an account of your life. We call it the Bema Seat. You're going to stand before a righteous God. And he's going to say, I want to know why you rejected that plan. Well, it just it didn't set well with me. Well, how's an eternity in hell going to set with you? It's not... You cannot separate the Word of God. I'm encouraging you to begin to study it from the start to the finish. Because it doesn't change. There is no indiscrepancies or discrepancies... Um, there's no differences between the old and the new that it, one feeds into the other backwards and forwards. You can read it either way you want to and you're going to come to the same conclusion. God is God. Jesus is the Lord of all and the Holy Spirit of God is within us. That's it. Start to finish. Amen. And you cannot learn about God and His great love. And you cannot truly learn of Yeshua unless you study about them from the, the, the Word all the way through. I, I had somebody say to me one time and I, actually I've had it said several times that, 
because I didn't go to seminary, or as Pastor Clyde used to call it, cemetery. I didn't go to it. And I'm not knocking, I, trust me, I'm not knocking anybody that's been because there's some really amazing institutions and teachings. The, the point that I'm making is I was told one time, well, if you want to learn to be a pastor, you need to take a small, simple passage and make it into an easy, palatable sermon where they get just one little light, easy, take-home thought. And that's what you present to them. And I don't have a problem with you getting a nice, simple, take-home thought. That's great. I'm all about that. But that's not what I was called to do. I'm called to be a preacher of the Word. And as a preacher of the Word, my job is to take and rip the meat out of this book and present it to you. And to challenge you to where when you get home this week, you, your wife, your kids, your grandkids... You're like, I want to dig deeper into what he was talking about this morning. I want to understand the depths of it. And you get home and you start studying the Word. And you break apart that Word yourself. That's my objective. It's to where when you leave this place, you're so filled with the Word that it drips off of you. And yes, all the way down to the infants, to the kids in the high school, to the young adults, to the oldest of the ones in this room right now. I want to so filled with the Word that the enemy doesn't know what to do with us. And you're not going to get that with just a little light take-home thought every single time somebody gives you a message. Are we okay with that? Because, I, I mean, this is church. I was told one time on Sunday mornings, you just got to be light with people. Don't, don't give them too much. I'm here for an hour slot, whatever it is, to teach you as much of the Word as I can give you in that time and to challenge your hearts and minds with it. Amen. You know, that's what Paul, the, Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians. The author of Hebrews talked about it, I think, in Hebrews 5. It's time to move away from the milk. Amen? Amen? Yes. It says, by this time, you should be teachers of the Word. And you're still going back to the beginning, the basics of the faith. He says, it's time to move forward. Get on the meat, people. Start eating the meat. I'm a carnivore of the Word. Praise God. So anyway. Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come from heaven to this earth is what Jesus is saying. All this way, I didn't leave everything that I left and come to this position to be a servant, to just say, okay, guys, I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to nullify the law. No, he says, I came to fulfill it in its entirety so that I could release you from the grips of sin. That's what we learned last week because how does death get its empowerment? It's through sin. The law reminds you of your sin, which empowers death, and you would always be bound to it. So Jesus, when he completed, fulfilled every aspect of the law, he released you from that and gave you the grace of God instead of the law of God to empower you to do something you couldn't do otherwise. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 7, 28, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. Jesus was saying to us, just like he said, if you release or relax, I should say, one of my Father's commands that you will be called least, there is a hierarchy that is established by God himself. That's what Jesus was saying to us. We don't get to choose, pick and choose who becomes great. Paul said in 1 Corinthians at 12 and 13 that we are all equal as far as status in the body. There's not one greater. I don't care if you're a pastor, an evangelist. I don't care if you're Billy Graham or somebody we've never heard of before. In the kingdom of God, nobody is greater in position and, and uh, power while we're here. But in his kingdom, once you're in that kingdom, God exalts. God tears down. It's God's to do. It's always been God's. Jesus said the same thing to Peter or to James and John when they came to him and said, Hey, Lord, when you get established in your kingdom, we want to be sitting on the right and the left. That means we want to be sitting in the positions of power and authority. And he says, All right, here's the deal, guys. I don't get to make that call. My father is the one that chooses who sits in what place. He exalts, he tears down. It's all the way back to Deuteronomy 30, or Deuteronomy 32, where, where God says it to Moses. I'm the one that exalts. I'm the one that removes. I tear down. I heal. I make sick. It's mine to do. I'm God. You're not. My rules, my kingdom. So when somebody says to me, well, I'm a good person. I should get in the kingdom because I'm a good person. I tell them, I, I didn't write the rule book. If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me, that's their rules, not mine. You have to abide by their rules. You don't get in because you think you're a good person. And newsflash, you're not. God knows our heart's desire. No matter what you say in here, no matter how great you look when you raise your hands and you're worshiping God, no matter how many hallelujahs, how big of a check you write and you put in the plate, God knows your heart. He knows your heart. And if your desire is to serve Him, God recognizes that. Your heart, He's looking for. 
It's the desire of the heart that changes everything. When Je Jesus came to this earth, he reminded us about the law and the prophets that he was going to fulfill it. He said, I'm opening the door. When I, what I'm about to do for you guys, I'm going to open the door so that you can have a relationship with my Father through what I'm about to do for you. That you can become reborn, as he said. Because when you're reborn, then you enter into my Father's kingdom. And once you're in my Father's kingdom, what you do with your time and what you do with your talents here on earth as you strive to serve him will carry over into the life eternal. Because your desire to serve him here is going to be used to measure how you serve him there. And if you don't have a desire, which is what Ms. Julie was talking about this morning, if you don't have a desire to serve God right now in any shape, form, or fashion, to serve the body, to serve others, what are you going to do when you get up there? Yeah. He talked to the people about what they understood of the law. Jesus changed the dynamics is what I'm getting at. When he pronounced to us the eight Beatitudes, this is what you will look like, this is what you will walk like, this is how people are going to recognize it, that you're truly a believer of mine. And then he says, I've come to fulfill the law. He said, because you've been taught a lot of stuff about the law, but I'm about to throw everything upside down. What you think you know, you don't know. And if you go past where we're talking about today, when you go further down past 17, Jesus starts going into details. You have heard that it was said you shall not murder, but... You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but. You have heard that it was said, you shall not, you shall not, but, but, but. Jesus was flipping the law upside down from what they thought that they understood because they had been taught the legalities of it by the religious leaders, the zealots of their time, but they had never been taught it's going to be a transformation of your heart. You're going to desire to serve my Father passionately. And it's going to require more of you than what you think you understand about the law once you step into this kingdom through me and through my sacrifice. He showed everyone what a disciple of his would how they would respond to the world around him. You're not going to respond to the world the way you've been taught by the religious zealots. An eye for an eye and that sort of mentality. You would truly begin to see what Yahweh was talking about when he said to his servant Ezekiel, God said, I will give you a new heart. I will put within you a new spirit. I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. That is what Jesus was trying to make sense of to these people, to his disciples. What I'm about to do, I'm going to complete the law. It's going to be removed out of the way. You're going to have access to my father to become a disciple of mine and enter into his kingdom. And in doing so, my father is going to give you a new heart. It's not going to be to serve man and to serve a series of doctrines and legislates. It's going to be that you're going to want to serve my father passionately. That's what he was saying to us. And then he goes on after he declares what you're going to be like in the Beatitudes, what he's about to do for us to get us into the kingdom, and then he pronounces over you and I what we're called once we come into his kingdom. He has, a, he has names for us. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, I told you I'd jump back to this again. This is what Jesus says. He's talking to, if you're truly his disciple, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its taste, how, it shall it, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp, put it under a basket, but on a stand so it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others that me see your good works and glorify your fathers in heaven. He said that once you understand who I am and what I'm about to do, and you come into my Father's kingdom as my disciple, this is what you are now. You are salt, and you are the light of the world. My original intent was that we were going to spend this whole message today talking about being salt and light, and up to last night, that's what I was writing about. And then Abba kind of said, no, you're going to hang right here, and this is what we're going to talk about. So I'm just going to give you a a pretaste of hopefully, good Lord will on the creek don't rise. Yes, I said that phrase just for you. <laughs> Next week, we're going to talk about salt and light. Understand this. When Jesus says, you are the salt, you are the light, he is not saying, this is what you're going to aspire to become. This is not what you will eventually reach as a disciple. If you are truly mine, Jesus says, you are salt and you are light. That's what you become. That is your title now. Everybody say, I am salt. And I am light. You should be a changed vessel. You should shine. You should declare. You should become what he has called you to be in front of everybody at all times. You guys ever heard of D.L. Moody, the great evangelist and teacher? 
The story goes that he was walking on the street one day, and this drunk man staggers up to him all over the place. He says, Mr. Moody, I'm one of your converts. And Moody looked at the man and he said, you must be, because you're certainly not one of the Lord's. If you belong to Jesus Christ and he is Lord and Savior of your life, you are salt and you are light. And you are to represent the kingdom as such. Everybody stand with me, please. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what he said to the disciples that night in the upper room, that discourse that he gave. And in saying this, he meant exactly what he said. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He commanded us in saying, By this all people will know that you are truly my disciples, if you have love one for another. They're going to recognize that you belong to me because of the love that you have for one another. And the love of God in us for one another is a sure sign that we are salt and that we are light to the world. The disciple John went on to write in his epistle to the church. He says, we know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are never burdensome. Our love for one another is proven by our love for God and for the love of his word and all of the commandments that were found in that word. Amen? And so you love one another because Christ commands you to, and the proof that you love one another is that you have to have the love of God, which means you have to love that word, which means you, has a love, you have a love for reading that word, hearing that word, discussing that word. And the more of that word that is inside of you, according to the psalmist, the more that you become equipped to become a greater form of salt and light. Next week, we're going to discuss what it truly means to be salt and light to the world. Hallelujah. Is God good? Amen. All the time. So we're going to get ready and close out in a word of prayer. I'm going to challenge you this week to get into the Word and study from the Old and the New Testament. Study some pieces. doesn't matter unless the Spirit takes you to a specific place. I want you to start studying back and forth between those two. You'll begin to have a lot of aha moments the more that you go back and forth between the Old and the New. It's all intermingled. You can't separate it. It's one continuous story. Years ago, somebody told Pastor Clyde, they were here talking with Pastor Clyde about, we liked Pastor Chris when he first started teaching because he taught these unique individual messages. And then he started teaching these series of messages. And they said, series messages aren't Holy Spirit led. That's just a convenience to him. And we don't like that anymore. And I, I told Pastor Clyde, I said, Pastor, I would challenge anybody that can take the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, just the four gospels, any one of them, pick one of the four, and you can teach a sermon, one sermon, and explain any one of those gospels in one message, its entirety. I'll even give you seven weeks of messages to teach one of the gospels in its entirety. I'll give you a year to teach and do justice to the glory or the grace or the forgiveness of God. You'll never touch it. You won't make a dent in it. This is one continual series. You can't separate it. I've never stopped teaching from a series because I'm teaching from the same book. Amen? Amen? Bow your heads with me, please. Father God, we praise you today for who you are. You are God. And we are but man. And we exalt you as being the one true God. The Lord God Almighty. El Shaddai. You are to be revered and, and lifted up as a holy. And we glorify your name as one vessel. That these vessels that you have created with a pure heart, a new heart, and put your spirit within us. Our vessels are to do nothing but yield glory for you constantly. So that one day... It will flow from us endlessly as we join in with all the saints of heaven, worshiping and glorying, giving glory to you 24-7. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together to hear your word being taught, to worship you as a body, to use our hearts, our minds, our souls freely, giving ourselves in this time to worship you, that we're not 
putting restraints or trying to limit you and your spirit as to what you want to do in these services. This is your time. We are here for you. And Father God, I pray that as we go home this week or today and throughout this week, Lord, that we begin to have revelations from your word because your spirit speaks to us by that perfect divine word. And I pray, Father God, that it begins to shake the foundations of every man and woman and child that reads that word, that it challenges their hearts, that it begins to well up inside of them, Father, as you said, Christ, springs of living water bursting forth, that you can't contain it, that it becomes an excitement, that you want to go talk about it at work, you want to talk about it when you're at home, you want to talk about it when you're at the restaurants. God, make us to the place such as the prophet Jeremiah said, I've got fire shut up in my bones and I can't contain it anymore. I've got to declare the truth. Bless them as they go out today, Father. These are your children. These are my brothers and sisters. Bless them exceedingly abundantly. Be with those that couldn't be here today because they're sick. Be with those that are weary and heavy-hearted today, Lord, that your spirit speak to them, that it lifts them up and encourages them, and you speak to them, Father, as only you can. That we will become a blessing to those around us. And that the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, will be glorified in all that we do. We ask this together as brother and sister, son and daughter, and the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And everybody said... Amen. Give one another a, 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 a hug as you go out. Love on one another. Bless you guys. We'll see you back this Wednesday. Love you so much.